there's a cat. All right, yes, Mike, I, I'm so sorry. Continue I with your introduction, please. <laughs> I, 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 when I'm not a cat, I am an open source project lead, open source maintainer, uh, small business owner, um, and and all about uh, aroused about, I guess. Um, no, I, I, so I'm. I specialize in background jobs. So uh, obviously in the Ruby on Rails community, background jobs is a pretty common application pattern for scaling your your computing, right? You, you create background jobs uh, for thousands, if not millions of things that you wanna do, and you can throw them into queues and have dozens of machines pulling these jobs and doing all your computing, your business computing as necessary. Um, and so Sidekick is uh, the most popular library or framework for doing that. And I not only have an open source free version, but I also have commercial versions on top of that, which provide additional features, uh, commercial support, commercial license, yada, yada, yada. So uh, that has uh, scaled quite well and um, it keeps me going today. I started Sidekick nine years ago and I'm still working on it every day. You work on Sidekick every single day? Uh, I certainly do the support aspect every single day because people email me every single day. Um, <clears throat> I also have another project called Factory, which is background jobs uh, for any language. And so I oftentimes will be working on Factory also. So this is um, Sidekick, yeah, it's, it's the project It's either Factory here. or Sidekick. You can see here Mike's page on GitHub. This is github.com slash sidekick. Um, that's not your actual page. <laughs> is, what, is the, what is the actual sidekick org? Is it under Contribsys? What is it? Just go to sidekick.org, the website. I'm going to go to sidekick.org. Yeah. To and uh, that has links to the GitHub repo. It has links to the FAC to talk about the project and uh, links to the wiki and all the documentation therein, that sort of thing. Where's the kicking? Where's your karate kicker? Oh, was it on the last page? The logo? I want the logo in the readme, Mike. I'm going to make a PR. Yeah, you're right, Jonan. That is obviously an oversight, which we <laughs> must correct immediately. Yep. Number one priority. You could ignore all the rest of your open issues and tasks. <laughs> hey, I, I much prefer to deal with the easy stuff than the hard stuff. So, Aaron, so Mike, do you, do you, do you, do you lead the development on Sidekick or are you more of a background worker? Good question, Ron. Um, I would say that uh, I can do both. You can either you can either put me in the background with the ampersand operator or I can work in the foreground <laughs> until I die. We have a question from the chat for you, Mike. Oh, sure. At what point should a team upgrade to pro from unpaid sidekick? Ooh. Um, I mean, once you have enough revenue to where it's a, it's a comfortable expense to cover. Um, I look at Sidekick Pro, <clears throat> the way I think about it is it's 80 bucks a month. And if you have a developer, if you're paying someone, uh, an engineer, you're, you're undoubtedly paying them $8,000 or more a month. So the cost of Sidekick Pro is 1% of an engineer at the worst. Um, and to me, uh, the support and the extra features do unlock a bit of productivity in, in engineers. So uh, if you're leaning on background jobs heavily and uh, things like batches uh, would be a, a really useful feature to have, uh, then I think it's, uh, uh, and also having the support where you can email me and that sort of thing. Uh, I think it. I think it becomes a, a pretty good value proposition at that point. Um, the, the, but the free versions out there for for hobbyists and for people who are just starting out to use, uh, and and I tell people use that as long as you want. You know, there's there's no, you know, I'm not demanding anybody upgrade. Uh, if you want to use the open source version, go for it. I, I I know of customers who've used Sidekick for many many years, and then they finally upgrade to Pro, and they write to me and say we've been using Sidekick for five or six years. And we're only now upgrading to pro almost almost apologetic but to me hey welcome aboard i'm glad to have you it doesn't matter if it took you five years or five months to get here um 
you know, I'm, I'm happy to have happy to have your support. I was checking both of your profiles for the sponsor section. I note that neither of you have set up GitHub sponsors. Yeah, I don't. I'm not a big fan of the sponsorship model. Um, I know some people like it, um, but I I don't. I'm not looking for like a tip jar kind of approach. To me, I, I sell tools to businesses. I, I I don't want individual developers who are who are working on their own or something to pay me five bucks a month. That that's just not. Uh, a, a path I want to go down. So to me, use the free version as long as you want. I want the money from the businesses that are actually using my tool to make a, a decent amount of money. Aaron, how can I get a pro license for Ruby? <laughs> uh, you got to hire me. <laughs> <laughs> you are the pro license. Yeah. <laughs> Well done, Shopify, then. Thank you to Shopify. And I want to actually shout out to GitHub, your former player, the website we were on for sponsoring Ruby Galaxy, and to Forum for sponsoring Ruby Galaxy, and to New Relic for helping to make this happen. Um, we appreciate all of you, and I, I can't tell you how um, valuable your support in making this happen has been to us. So we'll do a better job next time when I'm a little more prepared with the stream. I'll even put your logos just right there on the page for you. That's, I think, the bare minimum level of sponsor support that uh, should be required for a circumstance such as this. Can I just really quickly, I wanted to ask each of you how you got started with open source. Because I think in the beginning, we kind of asked like, what should a person's approach to open source is? But that journey is going to be different. I'm interested in hearing about what each of yours were. Um, Aaron first. Uh, my very first open source contribution was in, I think, the year 2000. Um, basically, just working on some library. Like, this is kind of awkward, but you know what? The, the time was the year 2000. We stored, I worked at a website where we stored, we had a, or I worked for a company that had a website that had a listing of people. And for some reason, we stored everybody's names in uppercase. I'll tell you the reason was at the time Oracle search was faster on text that was only uppercase. So we, I know, I know. <laughs> so of course, nobody wanted to see their names in all uppercase on the website. So what we had to do is we had a Perl program that would like fix the case of their names when it was displayed on the, when it was displayed on the website and, and Obviously, that did not work all the time. <laughs> so we used an open source library for doing that. So I was contributing patches to that to make it to improve that. The way I got started in Ruby, though, is like um, I was a Java developer and I wanted to go back to Perl programming. So I learned about Ruby. And in order to learn Ruby better, I just what I did is I just started taking Perl libraries and porting them over into Ruby libraries just as practice, essentially, and then uh, people started using those. <laughs> and then I had to that's support pretty them. Rad. <laughs> so that's what I did. <laughs> I like that, Mike. Uh, so I have two or three stories about starting with open source because I, I did open source one year and then four years later I did another open source thing that was completely different. And then four years later I did something completely different from that. Um, I'll tell you when SourceForge first came out. Does anybody remember SourceForge? Came out in about I want to say '99, but I wanted an excuse to use SourceForge. So um, there was this thing that was really hot at the time called Napster, and you could use it to uh, to download any music you wanted, right? To pirate music. And I thought, wow, that sounds interesting. And and at a guy, um, I forget his name, he had documented the protocol the week before. And so I said, I'm going to make a version of Napster in Java that could be run on any platform. So like Linux or, or Mac OS or Windows. And so I started writing a open source uh, version of Napster in Java. And uh, so I did that for like six months and that got allowed me to get to know SourceForge. I got to know open source development and the quirks therein. And, uh, and, 
that was that. I mean, nothing really ever came of it. I, I spent six months or a year building it and people used it, but it kind of went the way of, of Napster after a year or two. I think um, um, but where I really, oh, I, sorry, go I really ahead. got, where I really got involved with open source was when I uh, was working at a company and we needed to change Maven, the Java build system to, to work with our source control system. So I had to write a, a source control adapter for Maven to work with our, our source control system. And that got me on the Maven core team. And then I got to experience Apache, the Apache foundation and dealing with uh, project maintenance and, and that sort of stuff. That sounds um, way more professional than me. <laughs> it was, it was way more professional than you, Aaron. I must admit there, <laughs> there was no, there was no silly chef hats. There was no um, puns. I think puns were expressly forbidden by the uh, license, the Maven license. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, it, I, in fact, I did it while I was at IBM. So it was very suit and tie. I've been helpfully pulling up websites in the background here, including the GitHub slash Maven, um, one, which is not in fact the Maven project. There is no, someone it, who has the handle, but Jonan, have you not realized that putting GitHub slash whatever never gets you to whatever the thing is? <laughs> that doesn't work. It's not successful. No. I would recommend against it. Napster.com is presently on the screen. They're totally still a thing, apparently. So wow. is SourceForge. Wow. SF.net, baby. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, both of those were before my Ruby, my Ruby days, though. So you're in Ruby now, and you work on this sidekick thing. And I think you gave a brief introduction of what this was at the beginning, but I know we've had some people coming in and out. I wanted to just walk back through what sidekick is for people. This does background jobs. So it's yeah. like uh, Rescue. It's basically the same as Rescue, but it has a different name, right? Kind of, yeah. I mean, if you think about um, how, do you, how do you kick off some work? Um, you know, people build websites, and when you go to a URL, that will often hit a server, and it'll do some work to render an HTML page. Uh, you know, but what if you want to do something else? What if you want to send 10,000 emails to a to a customer list. Um, how do you kick that off? Um, do you go to a web page and press a button? What if you want to send it, um, you know, every day? Do you have to go to the website manually every day to kick that off? Well, background jobs allow you to, to create a, sort of a units of work for, uh, for, for any sort of computation. And uh, Sidekick is a framework for doing that uh, in Ruby and in, in, in Rails. I was teasing a little bit because I feel like Sidekick has become a bit the de facto standard in Ruby for background jobs. I used Rescue and even a bit of delayed job when I first started in Ruby. But uh, we're looking here now at the comparison graph for speed. And it tells me that Rescue is 240 jobs a second and Sidekick is 7,100 jobs a second. So if I want to send 7,100 emails every second, then I should be using Sidekick. Well, Jonan, you know, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics, right? <laughs> and, the, and also benchmarks. Um, those, are, those are hello world jobs, right? So that sort of measures the overhead of a background job system. And, and I have expressly tuned Sidekick to be as fast as possible and have as little overhead as possible. So um, it, it, it is for sure that there is uh, a lot more overhead in the other systems. But you know, when I started Sidekick, my, one of my goals was to make Sidekick one of the big three. I wanted it to be mentioned like rescue, delay job, and Sidekick. You know, that, that was all that was important that it, there not just be two, but three things that people always mentioned. And, and, you know, to your point, now it's kind of like sidekick is the one thing and then delayed job and rescue are also mentioned sometimes. So I, I'm, I'm happy that, that I've sort of achieved that goal. Well done. Matthew from the chat, Matthew D um, adds that there is a thread of difference between sidekick and rescue because of threads because it's, it's punny. I don't get it. <laughs> That's a lot for me to process, Aaron says in the chat. Well done. 
I'm glad we're back to the pun space now. So, oh boy, I actually wanted to talk to you, Mike, specifically about sustainable models for open source. And we touched on this a little bit because you had mentioned that sponsors isn't really the route you want to pursue, but you have, I think, demonstrated for open source generally how to do this, how to make a whole business around an open source project that still adds a tremendous amount of value to the community. We have open core licenses and other attempts that are being made across the board. I haven't seen anyone with as successful a model as you've used and one that has been so, I guess, well embraced by the community, like Elasticsearch, for example, got a lot of heat for making some changes to their license recently. So I wonder if you would talk a little bit about like your approach to licensing and, and how it differs from other, other companies' approaches to making money from open source. Yeah. So I, I think I've done t two things that are different than most people. Um, one is that I charge at all. You know, most open source projects, um, if they do anything, they'll do some sort of sponsorship or Patreon type model. Um, I, I didn't do that. I, I went the open core route and created products that I expressly want to, I want businesses to purchase. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm depending on engineering teams out there to budget some amount for not only laptops for their engineers, but to, to buy subscriptions to my software because Sidekick is, is typically a very important part of the infrastructure for these business applications. Um, the other thing that I did that was different is I didn't go the VC route. I didn't go out there and pitch VCs to try and raise a couple million dollars and uh, with the express intent of becoming a billion dollar company. Um, some people have gone that route. I mean, we were, we mentioned before we kicked off the show, uh, we're talking about chef, right? They went down that route of getting, I don't know, $50 million or $100 million in funding. Um, other companies like uh, HashiCorp have, have also gotten tons of, of venture capital. Um, I tend to think of venture capital as not sustainable, though, because really that, that VC is investing to get a 10x return on their money. So if they invest $50 million, they're expecting to get back $500 million. That's a lot of licenses, a lot of very expensive licenses. Um, and, and I prefer just to keep my price low. You know, my price is uh, less than $1,000. Um, and and so, I, so I keep the price low and that allows lots of businesses to afford my, my stuff. And it means that uh, at the same time, I can still make plenty of money to support me on my own. And I don't have to be paying for um, dockers and khaki pants and, and white shirts for <laughs> the VCs uh, um, who invested in me, right? So Aaron, that, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was going to ask Aaron about uh, his thoughts on this, like, what what model have you seen for making money in the open source community that you like? And what's an example of one that you dislike, maybe? Mm, I have to agree. So I, I like the I like the model that Mike is using. I think it's a good it's a good model to use. I mean, personally, like, I, I also don't like the sponsorships, the sponsorships model, because I think, mm, Let's see. I don't like it because I don't want to be dependent on the kindness of, I don't know, some benefactor in order to have my, in order to have my job. Like I want to be able to show like, Hey, I can provide value. This value is important to companies and companies will pay for it. Although I'm, I think what I'm asking for, I think probably what Mike and I are asking for is fairly similar. Like I want a salary basically to just work on it. I want somebody to pay my salary. I want, I want a company to pay my salary to work on, on something. Um, though, like I'm happy that Shopify is paying my salary and Mike just started his own company to pay his own salary where I think the relationship is somewhat similar. The other thing is like, I feel like if you just do the individual sponsorship type route, you may not be connected with 
the reality of how your software is being used. So like if I just had random people paying me to work on work on Ruby all day, maybe I wouldn't be making improvements that would generally be beneficial to um, companies or uh, the community at large. So I get experience from uh, our production systems seeing like, oh, this and this is too slow or what, you know, what is it that we need in an actual real production system? And I, that drives the changes that I can make where I'm sure like Mike sees similar stuff with regard to support, support tickets, things like that, like requests from customers. So I think that you don't have that, like when you just do an individual sponsorship level, you don't have that type of feedback or maybe the feedback that you get might be weighted towards those who complain the most or something like that. So uh, I just think that, you know, getting a, getting paid a salary sets up a better relationship between you and the person giving you money. Because if I'm just sponsoring you individually, then as someone who is not a corporate customer, I will have a hard time informing you about feature direction. The money will flow. Maybe you'll end up optimizing for the wrong things. Yeah, that, that, and also like, I don't know. I just, I, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to get tips from friends. How's that? That's <laughs> I just good. don't want, I just don't want that. On behalf of your like, friends, we want to give you tips though. Is I know, but it makes me feel, it makes me feel um, awkward. I'm going to ask another difficult question. How much like decision-making power do Shopify and Sidekick kind of have over what you're working on in open source? So we talked a little bit before about how like not having a PM is kind of like a liberating part of open source because you don't have someone like doling out tasks. How much of that freedom do you give away for that salary? And is it like a non-zero amount? Is it a small amount? So speaking only on my, for myself, I work solo. So I don't have a boss. Um, I'm, I'm the benevolent dictator of Sidekick. And so I can, I can take that product in whatever direction I want. Um, that specifically, I, if I decide to build a feature, I can decide what tier that feature goes into. Like, do I give this away to everybody and put it in open source? Do I, do I limit it to pro or do I limit it to enterprise only? So, um, you know, my product is, uh, our, our sets are in supersets, right? So pro is a superset of the open source and enterprise is a superset of pro and open source. Um, and, and that can oftentimes be a hard decision is, you know, I, I have to understand that, um, if I'm going to limit this to only to enterprise, then that comes with a significant cost and means that my free users won't be able to use this feature. Um, but uh, but that's those, that's probably the hardest uh, type of decision that I have to make. For me, I guess like, I don't know, the, the relationship I have with my employer is good. I mean, for me, the direction that we want to go is that um, is the same direction of stuff that I want to do. So it happens to like, it happens to match up. If one day, like Shopify was like, hey, you're only gonna work, we're gonna only work on closed source stuff that we're never gonna release to the community, I probably would look for a new job <laughs> is what would, what would happen. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess the relationship is mutually beneficial and convenient to me. So, yeah, I don't have, I guess I don't get to have the same self-direction that Mike has since he's his own, like, he owns his own business. I can kind of have that self-direction in that I can choose whether or not to find a new employer. <laughs> but Mike doesn't have to do that. Well, you have a purview within the range that you work on, Aaron, which is the, you know, MRI, right? If, yep. if you decide you can go, for, you want to spend a week researching a particular direction, you have that freedom, yep. I would assume, right? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. But I can't like, I can't be like, oh, you know what, I'm going to work on Node now, or right. whatever, right? Right. But that's, but that's a totally fine trade off for me. Like, I'm super happy with it. Right. Mike, you had something, were you going to screen share for a bit? Did you want to screen share something with us? 
I didn't I didn't have anything in particular oh, that okay. I, I had in mind. I'm, I wanted to offer you the option because I understood that might be a thing, but I actually think this is perfect. We will continue with the existing format where we look at the side. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine just I'm I'm fine just taking questions and and <laughs> and looking at the the welcome whiteboard here. So we have a whiteboard up in the uh, in the Zoom that says exactly welcome on it, scrawled with a, a paint thing. The stream right now is looking at the Sidekick browser, um, README, which describes the throughput, the uh, the table you have in the README here. We can put anything up in the browser, though. I'm inclined to go to <laughs> Napster.com sometimes uh, at random. The browser is, is free territory. Matthew has a question for you, Mike. Um, do you feel at conflict with the wider Sidekick using community where people build their own open source versions of pro or enterprise built-in features? Yeah, so that's that's a great question, and I and I get that a lot. Um, there, there's certainly tension there. You know, I'm not going to disagree with that. Uh, everybody wants a free lunch, and and hey, I I love to use open source too, um, and not pay anything for it. What I tell people is that uh, for every feature that I have in pro and enterprise, there's an open source version out there. You can you can cobble together with a half a dozen plugins. Sidekick Pro or Sidekick Enterprise or the, the major parts that you want to use. Nothing is stopping you from doing that today. The, the, the difference is that you have to test it. You have to test that all those things are working well together. Um, you have to test that it scales um, as far as you need. <clears throat> Whereas that's, that's what I provide when I when I sell Pro and Enterprise together, I'm effectively uh, like a Linux distribution where I'm taking all this software and I'm putting it together and then I'm testing to make sure it all works well together. And and so that's where a lot of the value comes from. Uh, they're absolutely well, also, right that. Uh, go ahead, Aaron. Uh, also support. I mean, that's huge. Uh, Yes, yes. Obviously, you can you can email me. But that said, uh, anybody can open an issue in Sidekick on GitHub, and and I will provide uh, you know a response usually within minutes, if not hours. So um, I don't I don't like to say that uh, that I don't support open source users or anything like that. But it's the paid tiers that keep me doing this every single day. So in effect, if you're buying a subscription, you're ensuring that I'm going to continue to support everybody. I just went to the page and tried to log in to create an issue and test your minutes SLA while, while on the live stream. <laughs> um, but I'm not logged in in my streaming browser, so I'm gonna spare you the wasted issue. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you're killing my SLA, my support SLA, that's right. So Sidekick, from an open source perspective, I, I want to understand the weight. Like how much time do you end up spending supporting open source customers, like your, your free tier customers as opposed to your enterprise customers? Because I think that as we talked about earlier, it, it has to at some level steer the direction of the project, right? That the features that you're building are, you, I would, if I were you and running a business, I would prioritize the needs of corporate customers who are trying to run Sidekick at scale over Jonan just created a joke issue to say hello, right? But triaging that work, do you just do it all in issues? And how do you determine who gets more time? How does that work? Yeah, so luckily, I, my, the, a lot of my business policies are shaped around minimizing the impact of the business on my day-to-day -day life. So um, I like to spend as much time as possible programming and adding new features to make Sidekick and Factory as valuable as possible. I don't like spending eight hours a day answering support emails. So I definitely try to polish all the rough edges as much as possible to minimize uh, support issues. And where I do start to see the same issue pop up over and over and over in emails, then I'll say, well, okay, well, there's a rough edge here. I need to, I need to uh, sand down and make smooth, uh, so that to to stop that that support email. I mean, ideally, um, my software is working at 100% when no one's asking for support because it just works. 
Um, now, I do ask people uh, to open issues where they have ideas, where they have feedback, where they have bugs or feature requests. And then, yes, I'll just work off of the issue backlog. Um, and uh, I've been I've been making an attempt this year to start to pair program with my customers so that I can both help them tune uh, factory and sidekick to work best on their systems, but also just so I can talk to them and hear, you know, what's missing? What are they still struggling with? Uh, how can I make it even better? And so that's already resulted in, in several new features uh, coming down the pipe uh, in both sidekick and factory. So it's just, it's an ongoing iterative process that, that happens every week and every month. Colton shared a GIF in chat that I'm suddenly regretting sharing in the browser, but it's a picture of me from a very long time ago at my standing desk, uh, demonstrating how to type and code at the same time <laughs> with a fan in my very long hair at the time. We're going to be done with that now. Thank you, Colton, <laughs> for the share. Yeah, that was really well placed. Um, so bookmarked. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. Glad that you got that GIF out there in the world. Um, so I used Sidekick a lot over the years, and I have to say I've not ever had an issue with it. Do you think that your issue volume for similarly sized projects is, is high or low on average? Well, I mean, I'm approaching my 5,000th issue in Sidekick over nine years. Um, and I like to think, and like I said, I treat every support email as um, as an issue that if it appears over and over and over, I try to I try to fix that that bad boy. So I, I don't hear that support. I don't get any more support queries on it. Um, so I like to think I have less issues than than the average project of that size. Um, but you know, like any project, you're going to get over a decade. You're going to get thousands of issues. It just that's that's life. So I don't know. That's I, I try. I try to minimize them. I feel like eleven open issues is winning. Oh well, sure. Yeah, that's yeah. tiny. I mean, we we've all hit. We've all browsed to open source repos and and seen you know hundreds of issues open, hundreds of PRs open, and the last commit was three years ago, right? That's that's just that just happens. That's that's open source burnout for you, and it and it happens to everybody. Aaron, what's the repo for Nokogiri? Uh, Sparkle Motion slash Nokogiri. Okay, thank you. I was gonna guess Sparkle Motion right after I tried Tender Love and Nokogiri. What is Sparkle Motion? Have you seen the movie Donnie Darko? Oh, yes. I have seen the movie Donnie Darko. <laughs> so Sparkle Motion Sparkle Motion is the um the dance group that the the family's daughter participates in. And there's a scene in the movie where somebody from the school comes to her house and is exasperated and says I just what did she say? I question your dedication to Sparkle Motion. <laughs> So we decided we decided to name the group Sparkle Motion. Also, it's a good name. <laughs> Nokogiri has more open issues than Sidekick does. You're at 160 on Nokogiri. Is this a competition? Yep. Yep. <laughs> I guess we're uh, winning then. Gemma You're winning. Isroff has a really great recommendation here. Um, Gem.wtf slash gem name redirects you to the right GitHub repo. Nice. Oh, nice. That's so useful because so many people, I go to their gem page on like Ruby gems or, and they'll link to the source somewhere else. I want to see the GitHub repo most of the time. I guess if, if a maintainer has a choice about where they want to host their source and it's not on GitHub, that's, that's fine. But I'm typically looking for gems and their source on GitHub. And can I, can I, uh, can I make a request of gem authors that you please add a link to the change log in your gem spec so that 
in you know as you release new versions people can see what's changed in this version nothing annoys me more than when everybody links to ci rdoc uh every other thing and then they there's no change log to be found anywhere so you have no idea what's new which is helpful when you're trying to debug an issue in sidekick and a gem you're using because you can't figure out what changed in that gem right I was looking at uh, Redis 6.2 this morning, and I my only question was, okay, what's new? And I had to go through like 10 links to try and finally get to the release notes. And then the release notes were half a mile long of every single git commit and every single bug fix that was put in. <sighs> Don't do that thing, maintainers. There I've should be a workshop on this. I have never in my life as a software engineer, how to change log help me. Interesting. <laughs> I don't think Interesting. I've ever had it help me either. I so think can you tell a us a little to be bit? Had there. Yeah, how does the change log help you? So for me, I like it when a change log is relatively high level and it gives me an overview of either like a new feature or it tells me, uh, if a feature has changed in a noticeable way. Um, I don't necessarily need to see like every single bug that was fixed, especially like the really arcane stuff. But um, like what, if I'm gonna upgrade to a newer version, I wanna know how is this gonna benefit me? And, cat and that's is so where cute. I, I'm dying, where, I'm sorry, your cat is adorable. <laughs> is she a Russian blue? My cat Pearl's mom was a Russian blue and she looked just like her. I thought she was a Russian blue when I got her, but it turns out now she's just a, a, a lame American domestic cat. <laughs> I think so, Mike, what you're describing, usually to me, that, that reminds me of the news file. So like new features, yeah. whatever. Yep. Yep. Right? Yep. I've like sometimes I'll read news files. News files are good. I like the news file in Ruby, but we stopped doing a change log in Ruby. There is no change log anymore. Yeah. Because it was just a list of commits and I don't find that helpful. Like I don't see how that's helpful to anybody. And like so, so like I said, I, I appreciate it when it's higher level. Like I don't want to see a, a list of git commits. Um that's that's garbage. Um and so that's why I like like when a new version of Ruby comes out, there's usually a blog post that says like, here's the top 10 features that you should care about. And that's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. Um, you know, in Sidekick, I keep a, I, I like to keep a pretty detailed, um, well, not detailed, but a change log, a high level change log of what's what's new in each Sidekick version. Um, and, and that's the kind of change log that I wanna see every uh, project have. Um, you know, obviously I do it because I think it would be useful to other people. It also happens to be useful to me so that I can go to this change log and I can see, oh, here's the four changes that are going to be in this next release. Cause literally I won't remember. I'll, I'll need to go back to my change log to see what did I work on? Cause I'm working on, on factory and a bunch of other libraries associated with it. I'm working on sidekick, sidekick pro, sidekick enterprise. And so there's, there's so many different issues that I'm dealing with every day, unless I have some canonical place where I, I, I list out uh, what's important for people to know about. I won't remember it. And if you don't tell people about it, no one's going to know about it. So if I'm, I like this actually, because we're turning towards the direction of like advice for new open source maintainers. If I'm maintaining a gem and it's starting to get traction, which has never happened. Uh, I have many gems and not once has it ever turned into a product, mostly because all of my gems are a joke, but there is a, um, a thing here where we can talk about people helping, um, are people, you helping people come into open source? Are the, are people going to be able to come into open source and create a change log and just call it good? There are some other steps I imagine involved in like common mistakes that you see people making with gems. Maybe we could give them some advice. Like what are your top three things that new, new open source maintainers typically overlook that you consider particularly valuable? Hmm. Can Good we question. start with I think, um, I think a test suite is really important. So, um, you know, spend some time 
getting to uh, know how to test code. Um, and a, a test suite really influences your API design uh, and, and for the better 99% of the time, in my opinion, um, because it really puts you in the, in the shoes of someone who's using your API when you're testing it. And, and that really helps when you're iterating and trying to make a, a better API design. So I think testing and having a good test suite is, is vital for maintenance long-term um, because over the, over the years, you'll start to lean on that test suite a lot more and more to make sure that future changes don't break something important in your functionality. Uh, so a test suite is, is one of the most important things to me. Um, like I said, I also like a change log. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm drawing a blank on the third. Maybe Aaron has some opinions. Readmes are nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, really? actually, read me, read me in a license. You got to have a license. Read me in a license. Oh, licensing has become more complicated and a bit more of a sticking point lately. What's what's your what's your license of choice, Aaron? Uh, I used to do all MIT. Um, now maybe Apache 2. I don't know. I, I use either MIT or Apache 2, either one of those. Because like, I guess most of the time I don't necessarily, I guess it also depends. If it's something that I think is going to, if it's something that I think someone will turn into a product, I would probably license it GPL. But I don't do any of that stuff. Like everything that I write, nobody's it's not a not a thing that be, can, can be turned into a product so i just license it mit or or apache 2. i guess like my worst fear is that i develop something then somebody t turns it into a product and never contributes back upstream basically the amazon business model in other words yeah yeah <laughs> so like yeah that's yeah you know, i think fortunately, that that's Fortunately, I don't write software like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of driving you... a lot of the licensing discussion, though. Rachel, what were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to ask what the difference is between MIT, GPU, and um, no, wait, that's the wrong one. GPL. GPL MIT, and... GPL. GPL versus Apache. Like, I actually haven't looked into the Apache one at all. Uh, Apache is very, very similar to MIT. It has one, just one more clause, which is essentially like it's a... Um, protection against patents. So theoretically, like somebody could patent the work that you did and then sue you for patent infringement where Apache 2 protects you, protects you from that. Uh, GPL has all those same protections, but they also require you to, um, if somebody uses your software, they require you to provide the source for it. So if they change your software, they're, they're required by the license to like, publish the publish the changes that they made but i think that's only if it's distributed i can't remember exactly the particulars like if they change it and then sell it they have to publish what they what they did so i have a thought here that many times when a company is getting ready to go public they will do this thing where they come in and they they evaluate all of the code and they look for anything that is licensed gpl and they pull it out and replace it because they don't want to go public with any piece of GPL code for fear of a potential legal issue where they'd be forced to open source a part of what they consider to be the value proposition of their company. So from that perspective, it seems to me that the intended purpose of GPL being to prevent situations, like we, we still want people to use the code. We just don't want you to be able to walk into a project and product, productize you know, many thousands of hours of other people's work. Um, and, and so releasing something over GPL to some degree means that it won't be used by a large customer, a customer at a public company, for example. Um, I don't know that that's optimal given the previous conversation we had around how large enterprise customers can help open source projects drive realistic feature paths. Um, what are your thoughts on that? So, um, factory is GPL licensed. Um, and I explicitly did that because I did not want Amazon or some other big company to swoop in and productize my service. I mean, factory is a server 
just like you know any other server like MySQL or Postgres or Mongo or uh, Redis. Um, Factory is a network service that you can you can sell as a SaaS. And um, I didn't want someone to just come in and productize my open source project and 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 never contribute anything back. So that's why I I uh, I licensed at GPL. Um, and I haven't I haven't had any feedback from customers or users that said that the GPL is onerous or they didn't like it. Um, so it's it, it, from that perspective, it's been a, a, a reasonable choice, and I, and I certainly have no regrets in choosing it. Um, you I know, think that large, said, go ahead, Aaron. Oh, I was going to say a large part of it depends on what the type of the what type of software it is. Yep. Like if it's a library or something, that changes that changes the situation. Like you maybe you maybe don't want to license a library as GPL, but a server for sure, because people Correct. can just turn around and sell it. Well, and that's, and, and so Sidekick is licensed LGPL because it is designed to be linked in with the application in the process, right? In the, in the Ruby process. So I didn't want to trigger any application, you know, people having to open source their applications just for using Sidekick. Um, so that's why I chose the different licenses for the different products, because factory is effectively a black box. People don't run their own code within factory. Um, and so therefore it can be GPL. So that's, that's why, uh, that's why the difference in the licensing there, exactly like you say. Um, anyway. No, please. I was going to change the topic. Uh, I was, gonna, I was going to say there's a website, I think it's called like choose a license or something. Maybe it's in the chat. If you like choose a license and then you just like say what you care about and it'll tell you what license you should use. So back to the conversation of new folks, you know, new folks coming to open source. If you're not sure what to choose, go to this website. It'll just tell you what to do basically, which is what I prefer. Cause honestly, like when I got into open source, I just wanted to write code. <laughs> Didn't want to think about like legal stuff but yeah unfortunately you have to so yeah i've been doing yeah. this for 20 i've been i've been in open source for 20 years now so i keep forgetting that you know there are people that are coming into the open source community every single day that don't know this stuff and uh don't know you know lgpl from gpl from to agpl to berkeley and mit um this stuff's not easy uh, for sure um and so going to websites like choose a license um, can, can really help narrow uh, narrow down and help you make the right choice um, though I think one thing I would I would caution people against is choosing a license just based on whatever the ecosystem does um, a lot of Ruby projects they just go with the MIT license because that's what Ruby uses or that's what rails uses um, and and I like to say if you're going to put a lot of time and effort into something, spend a little bit of time just to figure out the right license for whatever you're trying to to build. Um, if you don't care about it, then maybe it's not as important. But if you do plan on spending a year or two working on a project, um, getting the license right can, can be useful. Okay, so, so far we've talked about, yes, readmes. We haven't talked about what should go into them. We've talked about um, having a change log, and we have talked about what should go into those and what shouldn't go into those. We've talked about, yes, you need a license and the different options. Um, Matthew D has a recommendation, streamline and automate your release process. So how do your respective projects streamline and automate the release process? When somebody else does, <laughs> it's streamlined because somebody else has to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I think I, I probably have more personal experience with this than Aaron does, since I don't think Aaron releases Ruby uh, every no, year. We, yeah, we got to do it. So I, to be honest, be really honest, I have no idea how Ruby does releases, like zero, zero clue. I know that somebody like makes a tar file or something like that, but I have no idea. With the Rails, we just have like rake, rake tasks that you just do like rake, you just do like one task and then it just packages it all up for you. And, does its thing. 
And oh Lord, uh, do I have some complex release processes, especially for where something like factory, um, where I have to cross compile a Linux binary. I have to build uh, you know, a .deb file for Ubuntu. Then I've got to build Docker containers. Um, and then I've got to sign all this stuff with my GPG key and push it to my own Docker private Docker repository and my own Deb repository. And I'll tell you, I built this stuff over the last five years and I don't remember how any of it works. <laughs> and so I'm just glad I have a make file target and a rake file target for these things. And it's all automated. And I just remember the 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 make target I, I call to to execute all this. And let me tell you, the the most white knuckle moment I think uh, these days for me is when I upgrade my laptop because inevitably there's some sort of secret file on the laptop that is not on the new machine. <laughs> and Lord, oh Lord, I better not lose that secret file uh, because I got to copy it over to that new machine. Uh, and so there'll be, there's like a six month transition period every time I upgrade machines where I need to cut releases from the new machine for all my software before I can be sure that I can let the old machine go. So what I um, do, what, what I do is I make a backup. I have two backup drives. I make one backup of the old machine. Yeah. And then I keep that around. And then if I need anything, I bring it over. Yeah. But yeah, that's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> I just figured yeah, out how to add myself to the stream, so I'm back. Sorry, Lonnie's everyone. Back. Hey. That's somewhat, wow! Wow! Somewhat disjointed yes. experience for our stream viewers, but now there are four heads on the screen. <laughs> it really is, though, a matter of if you don't automate it uh, over the years, you will completely forget what you're doing and how to do it, and then you'll be up a creek again, and you'll have to reinvestigate and reteach it to yourself. Um, so I. I either automate it or I document how to do it because other, because every six months I'll have to go in and I'll have to read the documentation of how do I build myself a new server now? This is this like, this is hurting me. This is really hitting home right now. Cause the other day I had to do a, I had to do a release of psych the YAML parser and I had to do it for like, yeah. It has a JRuby build, and I never remember how to do like I never remember how to do that. And I'm like, oh. Uh, so I had to do all this research just to do one release. And I thought to myself, I should write this down, and then I didn't. <laughs> yes. In fact, I just re remembered if you go to the factory wiki, there's a development wiki page where I sort of document hey, how, here's how to get started with factory development. There's a section in there that I literally wrote for how do how do I what steps do I run to release factory? And I just go back to that wiki page every single time and I run the commands <laughs> such as they are. So if you wanna see how do I release factory, just go to that wiki page and it's right there in public. You should that live stream amazing. it. I wanted a live stream of you releasing factory. <laughs> it's really not very interesting. Oh, uh, sorry, I got distracted because I watched Jonan talking on the stream and it was a little bit behind and I was going to ask a question and my question was, so we've talked about releases now. What about the contributing.md? How do you encourage new contributors to like drop by and contribute to the project? And this can be like structured, like here are the things that I do that help bring in contributors or it can be like the more fluffy, here's the thing I do to like bring people in. I'll go first. Uh, one, one. I like to have a code of conduct, just so everybody knows like how to, like what's acceptable behavior here. Um, as far as bringing other people in, it depends on like. I think that's one thing. I just want to make sure, like I like to do in the community. I want to make sure that everybody feels welcome and happy and like is nice to each other. Uh, and that's uh, code of conduct helps with that because online we have a lot, I think we have a lot less context than we do in person. Like we can't see each other's faces or how people react or anything like that. So we got to write that stuff down. Just, just a, I don't know, part of online life. Um, and 
like the other thing I like to do is put in nice examples for people to work with or play with my code so they can like have fun, have fun doing it. I'll put that kind of stuff in the readme. So it's like how to, I don't know, how to use this stuff. Um, what else? I don't know. It depends on the project. Like some stuff I post that's open source and I basically do it just for me. And I'm like, I just did this. I thought it was a fun hack. If anybody else wants to read this hack, like super go for it. But I'm not necessarily looking for, like I'm not looking to bring people in. So it depends on, it depends on the project. Uh, like Rails, maybe we'll have, one point we had like the month of WTFs or whatever, we posted a big old thing and invited people to like write all their complaints in our forum and we would try to like figure out how to do it. So some, some things were a bit more active, but it depends on what you're going for, I think. I have to admit that as my projects have gotten more complex and, and um, sort of matured, uh, the number of contributors I get has slowed down pretty dramatically. Um, I still get, I'd say one intense contributor of a year for Sidekick. And by that, I mean someone who will submit a PR to fix one thing and then submit a PR to fix something else. And they'll, they'll have a, a flurry of, of five or six PRs over the course of two or four weeks. Uh, and, and, in, and in doing so, sort of scratch their own itch and, and try to improve things um, such as their own skills allow. Um, but aside from that, it's, it's mostly me just grinding every day on the project and, and helping out people where I can. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm probably not the one to be asking about new projects and getting new contributors. That's really interesting. Thank you to both of you. Is there anything else you can think about that relates to like, oh, actually I kind of have one. How much time do you spend like focused on like reviewing code versus focused on writing code. I guess Mike, your answer is like 100% writing code. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 most of the changes that go into my projects are from me. Um, that said, I do, I do pretty regularly open up pull requests against my own code so that people can see sort of, here's the set of changes that are, that are gonna go into the project associated with this new feature or whatever. Um, uh, and, and that way people can either offer comments um, and, and review my own uh, changes, um, or I can link to it in that change log that I talk about loving so much. And then people can see, uh, you know, historically, oh, here's the, the original changes that sort of implemented this feature or this bug fix or whatever. Um, so uh, I do I do review uh, code. I also um, will, I'm not shy about re-implementing a, a pull request that somebody sends me if I want to do it a different way or go a different direction. Um, I, I tend to really like code that's written in one style and reads as one style. So um, I tend to have very strong opinions on how to implement things and. Um, sometimes I'll work with a, an author to do it, or sometimes I'll just thank them and then I'll just re-implement what they, they originally sent me, um, such that it's done more in the, in the style that I would do it in. Do you have any kind of code, um, what are these, uh, things called linters that like enforce a code style in your project? Yeah, I use, I use linters on both factory and, and sidekick. Sidekick uses, um, uh, Justin Searle's standard RB, which uh, is a is a layer on top of RuboCop, um, and I just use the standard uh, definition of what Ruby Ruby format should be, uh, and then I use uh, there's a thing called uh, GoLang CI lint or something like that, which is runs like a thousand linting rules on Go code, and that's the factory linter, and and I fail the builds if they don't pass. Aaron, I, I think, think I, hmm. okay, go ahead, Aaron. I was, I was just going to say, like, I, I would say I spend probably 90% of my time writing my own code versus reviewing other folks code. But I'd have to say like 80% of that time I spend 
well, maybe not 80%, say 70% of that time I spend pair programming with other people. So there's, um, I don't know, I'd have to say probably like most of my recent contributions to Rails don't have my name in the author. <laughs> Which is like, I don't care. I mean, I don't care. It's fine. Uh, I just, I like to work with, I really like to work with other people on stuff. It makes me, it's, I just think it's more fun. So I had a lot of fun working with idea. you on my commit to Ruby. You remember that Aaron? When you I do. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Ruby. Yes. Do you remember then when you pulled my change out? Cause it broke windows a month later. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I remember. <laughs> I, I have contributed to the Ruby community for all of 30 days by adding a commit to Ruby. Uh, someday, I will come back around. I'm looking forward to getting more involved. Okay, we're going to pop out for a second, and we're going to have Christina join us on the Zoom, and we will be back very shortly. We're going to do a little bit of a guest shuffle, but everyone just stay tuned, and we will be right back. <laughs> 